This is Kyle Cleveland with Temple University Japan's ICAST, the podcast for the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies at the university. This is our second episode. And in the first episode, we talked with Steph Tajerik, who is the brother of Robert Tajerik, who for a number of years now has been the director of the ICAST. Robert came to TUJ a dozen years ago or so, and now we are co-directors of this institute. Robert, could you make a little bit of a self-introduction? Thank you, Carl. Uh, well, first, thank you for having me on the program, and thank you for hiring me at TUJ. Uh, I've been at uh, ICAST, as you mentioned, 2007. I was born in Paris. I moved to New York uh, when I was a teenager, when I was 13. Uh, went to high school in New York, uh, college and business school in New England. I worked uh, for investment banks for five years in, in New York, in, in London, in Madrid, in Bogota, first at first Boston and then at Goldman Sachs. After that, I uh, was very lucky to be hired by the late General William Odom um, to work with him as a researcher in Washington, which I did for 11 years. And in 2004, I moved to Tokyo as a Council on Foreign Relations Hitachi Fellow at uh, the Research Institute for Economy, Trade and Industry. And after a year at the Japan Institute for International Affairs, I joined Temple. How did you get from the United States to Japan? What was the trajectory there? Because as I first knew you, it was when Japan had shared the World Cup with Korea and had brought you into a panel discussion on Korea. But um, what's your trajectory? I, I'd always been interested in East Asia, international uh, relations in general, and uh, been doing research in Washington for a long time. I wanted to do something else. And um, I was fortunate to uh, win a Council on Foreign Relations Hitachi Fellowship. And then, uh, thanks to you, I had this extraordinary opportunity to work at Temple University. But I haven't been like a Japan scholar, J- Japan focused for all my life. And, you know, even though I'm in Japan, I'm also interested in what's happening in Europe, in the U.S., in other parts of the world. I mean, I wouldn't call myself a Japan expert. And so coming to Japan, what were the interests that brought you here? And, and what particular intellectual interest were you wanting to focus on? I think what I've always found most interesting in Japan is the modernization process. That is, one of the many things you hear in Japan from Japanese, whoever someone said self-orientalized, or from Westerners who claim to be experts on Japan is, Japan changes very slowly. Japan has a very old traditions. Things are done like this in Japan because they've been done like this for centuries. And that's totally false. Uh, Japan from the late Bakufu era, say from early 1850s uh, to the late 1870s, changed more radically than almost any society on earth, Uh, more surely than England, uh, the United States and France during their revolutions, maybe a little less than the Soviet Union during the revolution. The difference is the Japanese process was overall positive. Uh, The Russian Revolution uh, was a murderous endeavor. Uh, And that, I think, is is very interesting. The the way Japan changed in essentially one generation so radically. Today, we're going to talk about issues related to the rise of nationalism and the conservative, some might say a reactionary, nationalist movement in Japan with the election of Prime Minister Abe. How do you see these issues of nationalism playing out internationally now that we have Abe, who's in a conservative government, we have Trump, who's obviously very conservative and rode a wave of reactionary nativism, but we also see this in France and Italy and really around the world. I think it's different. I think you have two strains. The strain which Donald Trump represents, which you see in Europe with Le Pen, with Alternative for Deutschland, is somewhat revolutionary, racist, xenophobic, anti-globalization uh, movement. Uh, what you see with Abe is a relatively soft form of traditional nationalism and conservatism. Uh, there's a small intersection between the two, but they're fundamentally different. Can you elaborate in more ways? That How are they different? They're fundamentally different in that first, there is in Trumpism and the extreme right wing in, in Europe, a worship of violence, of violence against real and imagined enemies. There is an opposition to the current world order. Uh, there is a desire to wreck the system. Uh, in Abe's case, it's just a wish to go back to a more conservative era, 
to respect traditional hierarchies, quote unquote traditional values, but it's a very backward looking traditional form of what you might call reaction. Uh, in, in the case of Trumpism, it, it's not traditional, it's, it's different. It has some elements of fascism. Or at least populism. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Abe's grandfather was prime minister. Mm -hmm. And so is he continuing that legacy? Prime Minister Abe's uh, grandfather, Prime Minister Kishi, was one of these transwar period, transwar characters. He had been a senior official uh, before the start of the war with the United States. He had essentially partly, partly ran a Japanese control Manchukuo. He then had been a cabinet member uh, during what is known in the United States as World War II spent some time in prison as an unindicted war criminal, was freed, and with American support, uh, became prime minister in the 50s. Uh, there are some similarities, but the period is so different, and I think the personality is also so different that, yes, Abe worships his grandfather, but it's not the same thing. A lot of people associate the connection there to the extent that there's a continuity. Is current prime minister Abe trying to revise the Japanese constitution? Many Japanese conservatives, I mean, uh, officials of the LDP since the constitution was written, which is actually before the LDP was created, have wanted to revise it because they view it as a foreign imposed violation of Japanese sovereignty. Uh, so far, they have failed, and actually, the revisions they propose are fairly minor and mostly symbolic. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about two issues just to provide context. First of all, the LDP, you know, what that liberal democracy party represents, and then also how the Constitution was written in, in the first place. And I'm talking about the post-war uh, Constitution in the 1940s. Uh, historically, the LDP, founded in 1955 from the merger of the Liberal and the Democratic Party, has been a big tent conservative party focused on delivering the goods to the voters on economic growth so that the voters like them and re-elect them. In that sense, it has some similarities uh, with the Christian Democrats in Italy. So the Constitution was really imposed on Japan um, by MacArthur during the occupation. And one of the significant, I think mm. when people talk about the revision of the Constitution, mm. they focus primarily on the revision of Article 9, which is the an anti-belligerency clause that says Japan cannot build an active military and cannot go to war. Well, the Constitution was imposed by the occupation on Japan, but it was partly based on Japanese drafts of a revised Constitution, and afterwards it was approved by the Japanese people. I mean, every election in Japan has shown that a majority of Japanese voters are happy with the Constitution. So it's not something that was imposed the way the Soviets imposed their rule and communist uh, dictatorship on Eastern Europe. Can you talk a little bit about this so-called anti-belligerency clause that's in the Constitution? The Constitution includes a clause that Japan renounces the right of belligerency and will not maintain war potential. The United States realized very quickly afterwards that because of the Korean War, the threat from the Soviet Union, Japan had to contribute to the common defense of the free world. So the United States pushed Japan to create a military against the wishes at the time of the conservative leaders who for their part mostly wanted to focus on economic development and want Japan to have to carry a military burden. Mm. A more liberal critique of this revision of the Constitution is that it would lead to the militarization of Japan, perhaps even Japan developing nuclear weapons. I think, if you, how do we define militarization? I mean, Japan spends very little of its national income on defense. It's ruled by civilians. The military is under civilian control. Uh, let's say there was no Article 9. Okay, Japan would have the right of belligerency, which all liberal democracies have given themselves. I mean, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, France, Germany have de facto this right of belligerency. So that's not a rebirth of militarism. You know, the eminent historian John Dower mm. writing about uh, Japan in the 70s and 80s mm. era as the Japanese bubble was rising. Mm. He talked about, the he kind of defined Japan in a negative definition of what does Japan lack in contrast to Western powers. So, for instance, education without creativity, mm. and he talks power without leadership. So one of the implications of this is that Japan, by not having a military, does not have a seat on the United Nations Security Council. 
certainly having a military would not give Japan a seat on a permanent seat on the UN uh, Security Council. Actually, Japan had an opportunity, I think, to get such a seat as the Soviet Union was collapsing in the late 80s, early 90s, but it missed the boat. And I think now the door is closed and for the foreseeable future, it will not get a permanent seat on Security Council. It doesn't really affect Japanese national interests that much. Well, how is this discussion of the revision of the Constitution part of the larger project of Abe's politics? I think emotionally what Abe would like is to return to a more conservative Japan, one that is less liberal, maybe less democratic, that respects the institutions, the traditional institutions of hierarchy, of the monarchy. Uh, but the reality of Japanese society, and I think the reality of the bulk of the LDP is that they know this isn't going to happen. So they want minor changes to the constitution. I don't think it would affect the way Japan works for the simple reason that as a result of American pressure, Japan already has a military and already de facto has the right of belligerency. And yet when Donald Trump comes into power, part of his first agenda with regard to Asia and Japan is to try to redefine that alliance, that Japan should take on more of an economic burden. And with that could come Japan leading to a you know, rise of more militarism. Two things. Uh, Donald Trump, being politically, economically literate, believed that essentially Japan should pay for being defended by the U.S., not understanding that it's a win-win alliance for the United States. American officials since the 1950s have wanted their allies, both in East Asia and in Europe, to pay more for the common defense. At the same time, the allies have wanted to have a greater say in alliance decision making. So you have this trade off. The US, yes, pays a little more, contributes more, but in exchange has more influence on the way the system is run. The allies pay less and they have less influence. So the Americans for decades have been unhappy because they think they pay too much. And the Europeans and the Japanese also for decades have been unhappy because they think they don't have enough of a say. This is a continuing issue. It will not be solved in the foreseeable future, and it doesn't prevent these alliances from being very effective. So how do you register the current status of the U.S.-Japan alliance? Well, the current status, like everything which involves the current uh, presidency of Donald Trump, is obviously unstable. I think you could imagine Donald Trump at one point walking out of it. That's what he may end up doing with Korea, saying, if you don't pay more, we'll leave. I think that's very unlikely. Uh, there'd be enormous opposition within the U.S., there'd be enormous opposition within Japan, the Japanese may claim they'll pay more. Uh, these things take a lot of time, so they might not be, nothing might happen until Trump leaves office, either next year or in, in five years. Uh, but that's always a, that's a great source of instability, the fact that Donald Trump is president and has such views. When the Democratic Party of Japan came into power, part of their initiative was to try to re calibrate the relationship between the U.S. military and Japan. And yet they they moved past that. The LDP returned to power. And now you have a reestablishment of that alliance. I mean, that alliance was not wrecked while the DPJ, the Democratic Party of Japan, was in power. There was a continuous discussion about what to do with the Futenma replacement for, uh, plan in Okinawa. But the fact is the alliance survived uh, the DPJ. Uh, I think perhaps the problem is that in Washington, very few officials understood where the DPJ was, didn't have the right connections. DPJ was not used to uh, being in power. Uh, and actually, after Hatoyama was gone, it reverted to a more, quote unquote, traditional normal relationship. So do you see Japan developing nuclear weapons and, and changing its posture in the, in the coming years? You know, it's like the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, Japan developing nuclear weapons reappears from time to time. People say, I saw it, and then, you know, the monster is gone. I think the bottom line is that as long as Japanese government thinks that the U.S. alliance is reliable, it will come to the conclusion that the costs of acquiring nuclear weapons, the political, economic, uh, diplomatic ones, are far higher than the advantages. If one day the Japanese cabinet thinks that the U.S. is not a reliable ally, then I think, yes, all bets are off, and you could imagine uh, Japan acquiring nuclear devices. But uh, we're not there yet. Japan has the technology. It could get nuclear bombs fairly quickly. The issue is that it's not only a question of having, quote-unquote, the bomb. Uh, 
you need the intelligence apparatus, the command and control systems, uh, systems that can survive a first strike. So having a bomb in itself doesn't provide you with everything you need in terms of nuclear deterrence, though Japan already has some of the components. Well, I don't know if anyone is especially agitating for Japan to become a nuclear power. It's more of a latent issue related to one of the possible implications if Japan was to readjust its alliance with the United States, given the fact that it has North Korea and China as a regional concern. So how do you see, to, to the extent that there has been a recalibration after the Trump administration came to power and Abe returned to power, do you see that uh, the nuclear politics right now are any different than they were five, ten years ago? I assume, I'm not sure, that they are obviously Japanese officials asking themselves, is the U.S. reliable? What does this mean? What systems do we need in case the alliance with the U.S. fails? So I'm sure they all, you always have some folks in the government who thinking about acquiring nuclear weapons. My assumption is that right now, uh, the consensus is that it's not worth it. Hmm. Some foreign commentators have been quite critical of Abe and his politics. What's your view of Abe? It seems that your view of it, from what I've talked to you, separate from this, is that he's really more of a moderate. My view of Abe is that his supporters totally overestimate what he has achieved. They think that thanks to him, Japan is back, Japan is much more powerful, Japan is better governed. I think his enemies see him as the reincarnation of militarism, expansionism. And I think the reality is, yes, he is significantly more conservative than the LDP prime ministers we had, say, in the 1970s. Uh, He has made changes to Japanese uh, foreign policy, but these have been marginal and incremental. Japan, after almost 10 years of Abe, is essentially what Japan was before Abe. Uh, That's very different if you think of the United States and Donald Trump. Donald Trump is fundamentally different from Ronald Reagan, from George H.W. Bush, and from George W. Bush. There are enormous differences. If you look at policies, you compare Abe with Fukuda, with Aso, With Nakasone, yes, here and there, there are differences, changes, but they belong to the same camp. Donald Trump does not belong to the party of Ronald Reagan. In the last decade, particularly in the last five years, one of the central arrows in uh, Prime Minister Abe's agenda is to try to revise the Constitution. Is that discussion kind of off the table and and now somewhat dated because we're dealing with the COVID crisis, which seems to be eclipsing also? You know, I think yeah, the, the decision to change constitution, obviously right now it can, nothing can be done because of COVID-19. I mean, you can't tell the voters, well, the most important thing now is the constitution. No, obviously it's COVID-19 and dealing with the economic aftershock. Uh, the challenge of the constitution is you need two thirds in, in the diet. You okay. need a super majority. Right? So you need a super majority. They could maybe get it. I don't know. It depends what they offer. The And then you need half of the population. You need a referendum, which has never happened in Japan. Mm -hmm. Two challenges. One is, once you say we want to change it, different pro-revision constitutions have different ideas of what should be altered. Some may only want to slightly change Article 9. Others, in order to get their support, may demand that you add something about the environment, uh, that you have right. something about economic equality. You don't know. So you, then you have to get on the same page. That requires some negotiations. And then when you have the referendum, A, voters who are against it will vote no. And then you may have voters who are indifferent, but will vote no just because they're not happy with the government for one reason or the other. And if you lose the referendum, the problem then is that it could raise a question of the constitutionality of the self-defense forces. So asking the question, you're opening a Pandora's box. If you win, it's great. But if you lose, you end up being in a situation that's far worse than the one you were in at the beginning of the process. Well, this may be a cynical question, perhaps naive. But given the difficulty in really revising the Constitution, do you think Abi has ever really been sincere in thinking that it would be possible? Or is there something symbolic at play here that it's fulfilling some, a different political function than actually achieving the goal? Look, I personally have never met Abe, but from everything I've read, yes, I think he really wants to change the constitution. He wants his epitaph to be, this is the man 
who revised the constitution. This is the man who put Japan back on the map. This is what he really cares about. But I think he's also sufficiently realistic to know that maybe he can't do it and he doesn't want to risk everything on it. And also Japan is a parliamentary democracy, even though he's a fairly powerful prime minister, the decision to start the process is not his alone. He must get the backing of the party, and I think no one in the party wants to do this unless they're sure to win. Yeah, it seems to me that the further from which you view this issue, the more alarming it is, and the closer you get to it, the more difficult it seems that it could ever pragmatically be possible, yeah. and the implications of it seem to be so profound that I find it a little bit implausible to think that it might happen. As you mentioned, if they really open the book to this, then everything's on the table, not yeah. just the revision of Article 9. Yeah, it could be so. But I, I think, you know, even the Constitution were changed, okay. So Article 9 is revised, doesn't really change anything because Japan already has a military, already has, in fact, the right of belligerency. A uh, few things might be added. But Japanese society, after the revision of the Constitution, would not be radically different. Was this a gradual evolution to... a? Uh just maintaining the language and the principle, but really reinterpreting what that means? Did, was this a decision by accretion that happened over time? Or was there any triggers recently that changed? Well, no, the, the real trigger was the Korean War. Korean War starts. The United States says, we've got a problem in Asia. We're facing Soviet aggression, communist aggression. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with this? Well, we've got Japan. Japan is still poor, but it's got an impressive educated population. It has shown in World War II that it has great military and naval potential. So we want the Japanese to contribute to the common defense. So Japan was essentially ordered by the United States to develop a military. And since then, you know, that military has continued to be developed, though with relatively little investment, that is generally around 1% of GDP. Uh, but And there have been changes here and there to allow it to do a little more. Uh, but this has been gradual, but the, the impetus came from the United States, not from Japan. Did you say the military uses 1% of GDP? About, it depends how you compute it. Uh, one could say maybe it's 1.3, 1.4% if you use some NATO definitions. But no, the United States is, I think, at about, I, I could check on the it's about at 4% of GDP. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, Many Western European nations were 3-4%, even more, if, probably if you add uh, other non-economic, uh, non non-costs that were not included in the budgets. Um, so, you know, even if Japan were 2%, it's very really low. Now, the question, of course, isn't how much you spend, it's how much you need. You know, some countries spend very little because they don't face any threats. Others may devote the bulk of their resources to the military because they are under enormous threat. I mean, the United Kingdom in 1941 was essentially devoting all its resources to fighting the war. Uh, you know, today the Vatican invests relatively little in its military. I mean, it has an army, but a small one, because the Vatican is very unlikely to face military aggression from its neighbor. You know this argument by Chalmers Johnson in his book, mm -hmm. The Media Miracle, yeah. Yeah. that while the United States was squandering a huge percent mm -hmm. of its national budget and military mm -hmm. expenditures, Japan was devoting just a mere fraction, which allowed it to mm. d devote its resources to domestic issues. Mm. And that's some, one of the factors that played into the rise of the miracle economy in the yeah. 1970s I, and yeah, 80s. Yeah, I, I think that's a very weak argument mm -hmm. because the United States never spent a lot on defense during the Cold War. There was a spike during because of the Korean and Vietnam War, but it generally did at 4 or 5%, maybe a little more, which is not enormous. Uh, military spending has enormous economic benefits. I mean, why does the United States have Silicon Valley? There are two reasons. A free market, free enterprise, uh, very liberal immigration policies until recently, uh, bankruptcy policies, venture capital. But the other reason is the U.S. has a very strong military research industrial complex. Without the enormous investments the United States has made in technology from, say, military technology from 1940 to the present, there would be no Silicon Valley. And in fact, it's interesting, the country that comes closest to having something that resembles Silicon Valley is Israel. Its high-tech hubs are to even more than the United States, the product of its uh, investment in military R&D. What you've been discussing here, Robert, seems to suggest that maybe 
Japan is not in a moment of rising nationalism. Certainly, Abe's critics mm. make that accusation that we have a kind of reactionary nationalism here, but you don't really see that? No, I think, uh, look, nationalism is extremely difficult to define rigorously. You don't have... We're not talking about a scientific term. You know, it's not like you're looking at a chemical reaction and you say, okay, this is a formula. Water is H2O. I mean, what is nationalism? Yeah. But Japan has, has very few of the ingredients of what I would call aggressive or toxic nationalism. Uh, so let's stop at that distinction. Mm-hmm. You're making a distinction between toxic nationalism mm-hmm. and benign nationalism? Yeah. You know, so I think... You have countries that have elements of what you could call toxic nationalism, that is mm-hmm. territorial irrenditism, so, so ter- territorial claims. You know, they believe that there is a piece of land that they don't control that belongs to them. You know, in Japan, the Northern Territories, uh, Togdo, Takeshima, uh, Senkaku, Daoyutai, most Japanese couldn't care less about them. So you don't have that element. You have the ra- aggressive racism and xenophobia uh, that you see in Western Europe, in the United States, in Central Europe as well, and in, in other for- forms, you know, with the aggressively anti-Muslim uh, Hindu nationalism of Modi. You don't really have that in Japan. Uh, sometimes a sense that the country has been wronged, you know, say, reactions against the Versailles Treaty in Germany. That's not the case in Japan. The type of nationalism you have in Japan is conservative, maybe wants a little more respect or more importance given to the emperor, uh, maybe wants a slightly stronger stance against China and the Koreas. Uh, But it's not aggressive. It's not a nationalism that wants... War. It's not a nationalism that wants domestic violence, uh, except for very, very small fringes uh, that are politically insignificant. Well, is it not aggressive simply because it's been ineffectual, that it hasn't been able to achieve their goals and therefore... No, it's not aggressive in the sense there's nothing they really want. In other words, there is no piece of territory that a large majority or even a significant minority of Japanese want to occupy. You know, they want to take over. There isn't that conflict that you have, say, over land between Israel and Palestine. Uh, there isn't a sense among the Japanese that things have been horribly unfair to them. Say, the, the resentment that still exists 100 years ago in Hungary about the Trianon Peace Treaty. Uh, so you don't have that. And there is not, I mean, you know, is there xenophobia and racism in Japan? Yes, as there is in every country. But it's not a strong mobilizing factor for political parties. You don't run political campaigns in Japan based on xenophobia and racism or the way that the Brexit campaign was xenophobic. Well, Abe certainly has pushed his agenda as having certain nationalistic elements, but it could be that in Japan it's it's rather yeah. a matter of how these issues are portrayed. You don't have the belligerency in, in the rhetoric but at the end of the day, you do have exclusionary policies towards minorities. You have, between Japan and China, some of the most negative animosity of any two nations. You have discrimination against Zionistic Koreans. You have profiling of Muslims, um, totally unabashed racial profiling of foreigners um, on the streets. And so you have a lot of the elements of a, a very conservative kind of nationalist government without the kind of belligerent rhetoric that you see with a person like Donald Trump. But you see, I think you have to look at it in comparative perspective, both vertically and horizontally. Vertically, that is, is it really different from 10 or 20 or 30 years ago? You know, there probably was police racial profiling in Japan 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, Relations with China are not great. If you're a Chinese tourist in Japan, you're not being harassed. I mean, you can speak Chinese in the streets. I mean, actually, you're welcomed in stores. I mean, stores in Japan now, you know, try to have signs in Japan in, in, in Chinese. I mean, it's not the same thing. You know, if you were an Israeli tourist in the Gaza Strip, you probably would put your life at risk. Uh, so that's that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, if you compare it to other countries, you know, you can become, you and I could, if we satisfy certain circumstances, become Japanese citizens. In China, because we are not of quote-unquote Chinese blood, we could never become Chinese citizens. doesn't matter how long we've been there. doesn't matter who we're married to. Um, so yes, I mean, Japan is less inc- inclusive 
than countries like Australia or Canada, but it has a different history. By East Asian standards, it's probably average. Uh, you know, minorities, uh, again, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that minorities don't have a problem here, but I think if you compare it to other societies, is it worse? Is it better? It's, it's not strikingly the violent and sometimes murderous persecution of Muslims that you have in India. Uh, right. you know, there's police profiling, but uh, if you look at the way uh, a lot of American police officers behave towards African Americans, uh, you know, Japan is actually a pretty good place. But even in Western Europe, too, you're a visible minority, you're treated worse or better than in Japan. Not obvious to me. So I, I'm not saying Japan is doing well, I'm just saying compared to others, it's probably not worse, probably average. Well, I think you and I need to check our white privilege at the door. The way these mm. issues appear mm. to us might be quite different yeah. but than they, they do from minorities who experience yeah. the. But minorities, but I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying it's not minority. You know, is it? Yes, if you're black in in Japan, it's going to be very different than you and I who are white. Mm. But sadly, if you're black in the United States or Europe or Brazil, you're also treated differently than if you're white. Well, which, so I'm not, mm. I'm not saying that Japan is good. I'm just saying that this is not unique to Japan, and I'm not sure that. If you try to measure these things, it's very difficult to quantify them, that Japan is really worse. I think one of the points oh. you're making is that it's relative. It depends yeah. on what your point of comparison mm. is, what's your reference. Yeah. Because if you're comparing Japan to the United States, mm. to Great Britain, to Germany, certain mm. Western countries, mm. then it mm. doesn't seem to be in compliance yeah. with certain international standards on these issues. But then if you compare Japan to other Asian countries, Singapore, China, Korea... Maybe it but comes out in a very different Even I think if you compare way. it to, to Western societies, uh, you know, this testing done in, in the U.S., for example, you, you try to rent an apartment in the U.S. They did that at the University of Pennsylvania. They had three different types of students who called uh, to reply to an ad saying, you know, Joe so-and-so is renting an apartment. Uh, one group of students had a standard white American accent. Others had a light African-American accent, and the third ones had a heavy African-American accents. The responses they got from landlords was very different, and they've done similar things in France, too. You know, you reply to a help-wanted ad in France. If you're a white guy with a Western non-Muslim name, you're going to get a very li different response than if you're dark-skinned with a beard and you call Abdullah bin Mohammed. I think you know, even in countries like Brazil, that have a different history of, of racial history. Your experience as an African Brazilian is going to be very different than if you're a Brazilian who traces his roots to Western Europe. So I think even the by Western standards, I'm not saying that Japan is perfect. I'm, it's not obvious to me that Japan is worse. Well, in making these cultural comparisons, mm -hmm. the more specific you get, the more complicated it mm -hmm. becomes. The United States has a legacy yeah. of slavery mm -hmm. that informs all mm -hmm. these issues. Mm -hmm. Japan doesn't have that, mm -hmm. but if you go back to World War II and Japan's legacy of imperialism, mm -hmm. its relationship mm -hmm. to its other Asian neighbors that mm -hmm. have fallen under its control, then you have a different dynamic that plays out. Yes, but no, well, I mean, Japan was late to imperialism. So, you know, most Western countries, the U.S. included, have empires, uh, and that legacy plays everywhere. The difference for Japan, there are two different, there, there are two differences for Japan. One is that its relationship with China is extremely important, and its relationship with South Korea is important. Uh, in many Western societies and the United States, the relationship with the former colonized societies is so unbalanced that, to put it crudely, they're not happy doesn't really matter. In the case of Japan, it does. Secondly, because Japan made the catastrophic decision of aligning with Nazi Germany, Japan today will be compared with the way the Federal Republic of Germany handles its past. And obviously, by these standards, Japan has failed enormously. And that's something which Japanese policymakers have failed to understand. A, that they have to have a quote-unquote German standard, because that's whom they're going to be compared with, whether they like it or not. And B, that because of the geopolitics of their former colonies and the countries they invaded, these are very, very important issues. But then if you compare to former uh, imperial, other former imperial powers, you know, the United States killed 100,000 Filipinos when it invaded the Philippines. Uh, first, I think 99% of Americans are totally unaware of it. 
And don't think the U.S., if you go to U.S. museums or whatever, I don't think you're going to see many exhibits on this. Um, if you look at the colonial history of the European powers, it varies, but in many cases, there's absolutely no awareness of the crimes that were committed. The, the difference, again, is that the consequences for the Europeans are far less important than they are for Japan because of the geopolitics. As we were talking about nationalism, one of the points you were making is that Japan's nationalism is, really needs to be looked at distinctly and differently than the way nationalism has been playing out in this mm. contemporary era in other countries. Could you discuss it a little more length about Brexit, how the nationalist movements that have arisen in Italy, France, and other places? Well, Brexit is different because Brexit is a Japan is not integrated with anything comparable to the European Union. So Brexit was a xenophobic, populist, I think at the margin racist. I don't think every Brexit voter was racist, but some were. Reaction not only to, to globalization, to European integration, to immigration, uh, also fueled by economic inequality, a feeling on the part of working class and middle class Britons that they had been left back feeling on the part of perfectly prosperous Britons, as you have in the United States with Trump voters, that somehow the country has changed, you know, because it's mm -hmm. not the kind of ideal white Christian society they yeah. liked. Uh, that process doesn't exist in Japan uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and in on, on the European mainland, it's also in a, a process that is fairly similar to Brexit. That is a reaction against integration, uh, immigration, modernization uh, that you don't have in Japan uh, because you don't have the elements. Right. The two things you have in Japan is general prosperity, you know, mm -hmm. a largely mm -hmm. middle class. Mm -hmm. Although you, obviously you do have precarious labor mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. poverty. And you also don't have the minority issue of, of jobs being taken away. It's quite the mm -hmm. opposite. Japan is seeking to get foreign yeah. labor. To, and I mean, you know, the immigrants in the U.S. And, and Europe have contributed to job creation. But it's easy to sell the idea that they're stealing jobs. Here, it's harder because there's so few immigrants. You know, how are you going to convince the Japanese equivalent of Joe Sixpack that he's a victim of immigration? Uh, so that's different. And in Europe also, sometimes you have the, in Europe, you have the consequences, the colonial wars. Uh, that's something I think you see in, in, in the French um, reaction against uh, French Muslim residents of Arab extraction, that you can't untie this from the consequences of the Algerian war. In the U.S., obviously, you have slavery and you, you can't understand American ethnic and racial politics without knowing the history of uh, African slavery and of the Civil War. So in Japan, you don't see ethnic nationalism in the contemporary era, a race-based notion of nationalism. Well, you have it in the sense that in Japan, I mean, because I mean, they are naturalized Japanese. I mean, there are Japanese citizens who are of African or European or ancestry, and and there are really quite a few also Chinese who have naturalized. But still, that's a small percentage of the population. So, for most Japanese, even if they when they think of what it is to be Japanese, they think that being Japanese means your parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents were Japanese. Yeah. Because that's actually, if you look at the data, that's the case. Uh, the notion, the modern notion of citizenship that is based on law, not based on race and ethnicity, is extremely important uh, for a country like the UK, because a lot of Britons do not have grandparents who were British. So if you define being British as being someone whose like, great great grandparents were already in England or in Wales or in Scotland, you're excluding a very large percentage of the British population. In Japan, the fact is you're not because there are not that many of them. So that's the difference. Well, we might raise the question of why there aren't that many of them. I mean, what we have mm. at the point of entree at immigration is Japan is exclusionary. I mean, that's a form of discrimination. No, that's a form that it's it's not discrimination in the sense that it's just saying that they, they don't they, they there's not been any immigration, but that's not unique to Japan. You have that in, in South Korea, uh has historically had very low immigration, though now it does. So partly the consequences of Japan's economic path, of its demography, uh of its language, of its history. Uh, but you have you have many societies that have that have or have had until very recently very few 
immigrants who came into it. I mean, you know, how many, uh, you can see that in Central Europe, where Im immigration into Central Europe is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, you have that in Ireland, where now the significant immigrant population that's very new. Uh, so Japan is not the only country in that situation. I know that um, you've often been very generous with your time and have taken students over to Yasukuni Shrine. So I think of you as a security specialist and a person who has a particular expertise on military history. Why are you so interested in Yasukuni? What does that represent for you? Why is that an important historical site? Yasukuni is interesting. I mean, more precisely, the, the museum, the Yushukan, Yasukuni itself, you know, the shrine, there isn't much to see except for a few um, cherry trees. Uh, but the museum is interesting because it's a description of what you might call the conservative view of Japanese history, especially during the 30s and 40s. That is the idea that Japan was a victim of Chinese and Western hostility, that Japan had to defend itself, that it was a war fought for the liberation of East Asia. That's the first point. The second thing that is striking about Yasukuni is that military museums always emphasize victories. And when they relate the stories of soldiers who died in battle, the idea is that they died to achieve a greater goal. They died for victory. Yasukuni, to some extent, is a museum that worships death. Uh, yeah. There's a Spanish general, Milan Astre, who reportedly shouted, or some of his supporters shouted, Viva la muerte, long live death. And when you go to the Yushukan, it's really a commemoration of death, of death for the sake of death especially the coverage of the 1940s, I mean, of the, what they call the Great East Asia War. I mean, that, that starts in, in, uh, in, um, with the Sino-Japanese War in 1931. Um, so that's the other thing. It's somewhat reminiscent of something that I noticed when I went to the White House of the Confederacy. That's uh, the um, house where Jefferson Davis, the leader of the, of the Confederate States, lived. Mm -hmm. And... You can. I visited it so some time ago, uh, and there's no mention of slavery. Uh, and of course, you go to the Yushukan, there's no mention of the crimes against humanity, the war crimes that were committed. Now, that's not unique, to be fair, to, to military museums. I mean, you see that in many other countries. But because Japan ended up losing, because it was fighting for in defense of such an evil organization, namely the Axis, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, and their lesser allies, uh, it's somewhat rem reminiscent of what you see in the South, in these monuments that commemorate uh, the Confederate States. Well, if you compare it to the United States, to, for instance, the mm. Vietnam War Memorial or the Korean mm. Memorial, mm. there seems mm. to be a reference to the loss mm. and the tragedy mm. of what this represented for betrayal of American ideals. You don't seem to have that reference point in, in Japan. It's more of a kind of a victimology of Japan mm. having suffered defeat. Mm. And I think another very important thing that a lot of people when they discuss uh, mm. Yasukuni don't really get to is that ultimately this is a Shinto shrine. Now, Shinto was kind of hijacked under mm. state Shinto, mm. Shintoism, but it is in fact Shinto. And so mm. maybe that helps explain mm. the death fixation because Shinto has this notion of restless souls. Partly, um the Yushugan's coverage of the Meiji era is much more balanced. Uh, is I mean, it has a tilt, but is somewhat accurate. It really becomes straight propaganda when you reach the 1930s, even a little before. Uh, of course, the, the Yasukuni is not a traditional Japanese shrine. What it reflects is the desire of the Meiji leaders to infuse the Japanese people with a sense of nationalism. They realize that the Westerners were strong not only because of their hardware, their ships, their cannons, their rifles, but because of the software. Namely, that Western populations, by the time uh, Japan confronted the West in the 1850s, 1860s, had a sense of nationalism, of patriotism, which the average Japanese didn't at the time. The average Japanese thought of his country as his local kuni, his local han. Uh, there was no sense of a Japanese nation. And the Meiji leaders also understood that you needed symbols to foster a sense of nationalism. And what you see in the West very often are memorials that commemorate the war dead as part of an effort to create this sense of 
nationalism, of patriotism. Uh, and the thing, of course, uh, Yasukuni resembles most maybe is St. Paul's Cathedral. I mean, it's not as beautiful, of course, uh, in the sense that you have there a fusion of the Anglican Church, of the state church. After all, the Queen of England is the head of that church mm. and military valor. Uh, because the, the memorials you have, if you think of Arlington in the United States, if you think of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, they're not religious memorials, especially the Arc de Triomphe. Uh, I mean, Arlington does have religious symbols on the tombs, but it's not a religious shrine. Uh, so there is, with state Shinto, this desire to create a state religion that induces the population to view itself as part of, an, of a nation. There's also a similarity with Caesaro Papism, that is with the Tsarist concept of the Tsar as head of the church and head of the nation uh, that comes from Byzantium. Well, it is a public shrine, but it seems to me that mm. although you do have the Greedy Families Association mm. and some Japanese people obviously go to this, it seems to have more of a, a meaning for the state and state-level politics. I know with a lot of my students, both American or foreign students and Japanese students, the Jap many of the Japanese students have never really heard of Yasukuni or don't know what it represents. Yeah, because the truth is, again, Japan has very low levels of nationalism. So most Japanese, you know, I have a test. Um, I have a flag that was flown on the flagship of Admiral uh, Togo at the Battle of the Japan Sea, what we know as the Battle of Tsushima, the greatest Japanese naval victory. I mean, an event that is extremely important in the history of Japan's rise as a global power. And when I show this flag uh, to my Japanese friends and guests, uh, they never know what it is. They barely know about this battle. The only one who really knew about the flag was a friend of mine, but he's a Japanese admiral, so obviously he knew about the story. Uh, how many Japanese are aware of the, of the great military victories of the Meiji state? Uh, very few. As you say, they don't know about Yasukuni. Uh, so this is not a country, because again, this is a country that doesn't uh, tick many of the boxes for nationalism. It doesn't have a sense of victimhood. It's very important for nationalism. Or it doesn't have a sense that we have to continue to conquer lands. You know, something that you had that was very strong, say, in Europe in the age of the second imperialism in the 19th century. You know, let us conquer colonies. I mean, Japanese have no desire to occupy any country, to set forth, establish colonies, gain territory. Uh, they don't have any particular interest in their military. Uh, so it seems what you're arguing is there's mm -hmm. not really a continuity between the nationalism of World War II, in which mm. you certainly did have mm. an imperialist outreach for conquering foreign lands, mm. and today's version of nationalism, mm. which you see as being much mm. more benign. I mean, my view of this is that nationalism is like a, a bass note in music. To, there's an underlying foundation mm. there, but you mm. don't have it in quite such a vivid way. It doesn't mean that mm. it's not there. It's no, just it's, hidden out of sight. Yeah, it's, it's not strong in the sense, I mean, you see it, for example, you know, not that many Japanese are interested in joining the armed forces. Uh, if you compare same thing, if you compare to the U.S., there's much higher rates of nationalism. I don't. I'm not talking about the Trump xenophobia stuff. I'm talking about just nationalism, patriotism. In the U.S., if you and I were 20 year olds and wanted to go into politics, one thing we would probably consider is joining the military. You know, spending spending four years and coming back, then running for office, saying I was a Marine. You know, I killed enemies of the United States. That's good. That's a that's a standard yeah. way. Whether we're Democrats or Republicans, that's not a bad thing. In the U.S., I think there was one, I think Gen Nakatani had served in the military. I mean, if we were 20, you know, KU University is not too far from now, and we from here, and we said, hmm, let's say I want to get elected to the Diet. I want to become a cabinet member. What should I do? None of us would think of joining the armed forces. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we'd think of maybe getting into politics very early, uh, marrying someone who's from a political family and then get adopted by her father or mother, uh, making a lot of money quickly so that then we can fund our campaigns. Well, is this mm -hmm. largely a generational mm -hmm. thing, that you have a kind of nostalgic nationalism in which elderly politicians such as Abe, mm -hmm. and, you know, many of the politicians of power in Japan are men who are in their 70s or older. They lived through some, or at least well, a very close experience to World War II. I think, I mean, so it means something different to them than what it does for the current no, generation. I think it's actually interesting. If you look at this, the I think the generation of Japanese politicians who experienced the war were relatively 
anti-nationalist after the war because they really saw the horrors of war. The ones that came after who didn't see the war, like Abe, may be a little more nationalistic because they've never been bombed. Uh, you know, they've never seen hordes of men who were maimed, uh, widows and orphans. Uh, but again, I think their nationalism remains tame and soft. I mean, maybe in his heart, Abe is a real hardcore nationalist, but you know, to get elected, you've got to do what the voters want up to a point. And I think Abe and all the others are smart enough to know that the average Japanese doesn't, when he's looking at the menu to select which politician he wants to vote for, he's not looking for the hardcore nationalist. He's not looking for someone who's always photographed next to the military who says, you know, I, I just mm -hmm. came back from, uh, from battle and I personally shot at our enemies. That's not what he's looking for. He's looking, the average voter, he or she knows, is looking for someone who's going to steer the economy, do well, keep Japan safe, uh, not only in the military sense, but in economic terms, environmental terms, but that's that's not very high on the, on the agenda. So I think... There does seem yeah. to be a disconnect from what your average mm. citizen thinks about these issues mm. and what politicians do. Mm. And it's, it's odd, even ironic, that mm. yet... Prime Minister Abe is now the longest serving Prime Minister yeah. of Japan. He's but, been brought back to power with this is really on the front burner of his agenda. It's a front burner. Well, it is and it is not. It is emotionally on. But after all, you know, the first thing you need to do if you want a stronger military is you've got to spend more money. You know, this is this is a business where money talks. Look, Abe has been in power for, what, nine years now? LDP for much longer. Defense budget under Abe has gone up a little, but very marginally. Uh, Japan could easily afford to spend three or four times more than it does. No problem. Uh, I mean, there are countries that are in far, far less rich, worse economic situation that do it. Why hasn't he done it? Maybe because he knows it. Maybe because he doesn't want it, but also because he knows that's not what the voters want. I mean, if Abe gave a speech and said, okay, next year's budget, this is it. This is the plan. Okay, over the next five years, the budget for the military is going to go from X to 4X. This would guarantee a catastrophic defeat at the polls. First, most of the members of the Diet wouldn't vote for it because regardless of whether they thought it was a good idea or a bad idea, they knew that when they told the voters, okay, you know, we've had to make some cuts in this these programs and those programs or we've got to borrow more but that's because we're going to spend the equivalent of trillions of dollars more over long term on the military they'd be dead on arrival so abe hasn't done much on his agenda well and of course they don't need to put that expenditure out because they have the us japan mm. alliance and but, in a manner of speaking have the world's yeah. largest military which is the united states yeah. military. but if you're a nationalist you don't want to depend on the u.s uh, a nationalist wants to be strong on his own. And, you know, if Japan, Japan would still be a U.S. ally, but if Japan spent three or four times more, I'm not saying it should, it would have a much greater voice on the U in the U.S.-Japan alliance. That's actually something that a lot of Americans who advocate for a stronger Japanese military don't realize, is that if Japan devoted the same proportion of its resources the U.S. does to the military, it would still have armed forces that are far smaller than the U.S. because the Japanese economy is smaller, but in the Asia-Pacific region, it would be equal to maybe stronger than the U.S. And so suddenly the U.S.-Japan alliance, rather than having the U.S. in the driver's seat and Japan can as a junior co-pilot, they would really have to have two men or two women at the controls. And that would change the nature of the U.S.-Japan relationship. But so the fact is, yeah, you know, Abe has been a little more proactive. But Abe also, you have to see, has done made significant efforts to improve relations with China. I mean, you know, within limits. Um, I think he's failed totally on Korea, though it's been difficult to deal with the current G Korean government, so he doesn't deserve 100% of the blame. Uh, if, you, if you go through actually what has been done in the past nine years and you ask yourself, how would it have been different if instead of Abe, it had been, say, a Fukuda, who was considered to be a more dovish LDP politician? I think the answer is it wouldn't have been vastly dissimilar. Whereas if you ask yourself, Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan, yes, policy on immigration, on NATO, on relations with the allies, on trade, that would have been radically different. Robert, this has been a very interesting conversation. 
And I appreciate you taking the time. It was a real privilege to be able to talk to your brother, who I had not met until quite recently, and then also to be able to learn from you on these issues. Robert, I hope you're well. I hope your family's uh, safe during this these strange days. And I uh, appreciate you taking the time today. Well, thanks, Scott. It's been great uh, dialogue, having a dialogue with you uh, thanks to this program. Thanks for joining us today. This podcast is an initiative of the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies at Temple University's Japan campus. To learn more about the Institute, please visit www.tuj.ac.jp forward slash ICAS. Again, that's tuj dot ac dot jp forward slash icas or follow us on social media be sure to subscribe to the podcast for the next episode thanks for listening and see you next time